Welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast, where you are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Gospel Spice is your Christ-centered podcast infused with in-depth biblical flavors and sprinkled with a dash of French culture, guaranteed to spice up your relationship with God. I'm your host, Stephanie Roussel, and here is today's episode. So Kurt Thompson, welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast. (laughs) Stephanie, thank you so much. It is a delight to be here. Oh, the delight is definitely shared. (laughs) And that's a very good choice of words because that takes us straight into Mm. what I would love for us to discuss. We are uh, here at Gospel Spice in this new series titled God's Glory, Our Delight. Mm. You just used that word. So Mm. Mm. um, what does that expression, God's glory, our delight, which is my personal motto, what does that evoke in you? Well, you know, it's uh, uh, it, it's it's really interesting. I, I think that um, at the same time that all of us, if we, if we if we hear the word delight, I think our intuition, our inclination is that, yeah, I I like that idea. I got to get me some of that. I got to get me some of that delight stuff. Whatever that is, that sounds like a good idea. And I also find that there is a certain almost immediate, now this is, this is part of my own story, but there's also a certain part of me that's like, uh, delight is awesome. When's the other shoe going to drop? Mm-hmm. And so in some respects, um, you know, the whole notion of God coming yeah, with his glory and with his, and with all of the things that would evoke delight in me, uh, I'm aware uh, simultaneously evokes additional things that I have to contend with and I'm aware of and have to kind of do something about that. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in the work that, that I do and, that, you know, in our practice that we do, um, you know, we, we talk about how uh, the leading edge of the gospel is not uh, we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. The leading edge of the gospel is that God can't imagine his good fortune at being able to be with us. And he wants us to experience that as much as he wants us, I mean, he wants us to experience his delight being in our presence as much as he wants us to experience delight being in his. And at the same time, that leading edge immediately evokes within me the parts of me that have a hard time receiving that. And so it's a long-winded answer to your question, but I, I, I would say that it is, uh, you know, I, I, I long to be better able to receive his delight. And uh, we say that in the work that we do, we want people to hear first and foremost that that's where God begins. God, you know, as we like to say, it's easy for us when we look at the beginning texts of Genesis. Uh, we often begin with Genesis 3. We begin with the trouble. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense because like, you know, I'm not hard for me to look around in my life and find trouble, but we then say, gosh, it would actually make more sense for us to begin in the beginning, which in Genesis one and two is all about God's delight and his glory and his joy in having made us in the first place. And so I'm uh, practicing uh, uh, wanting to receive that more and more and uh, doing the, we might say sanctification work of discerning how it is that I have a hard time receiving that and doing the work of, uh, you know, receiving that a little more effectively. Yeah, I I think it's very, it feels to me very accurate to say that in order for me to enjoy God more and more, to delight in me, to make his glory my delight, that does come with the, the other side of that coin, which is to discover that my glory is the delight that he takes in me. Mm-hmm. And that's like our identity is wrapped around the, d- the delight that he takes in us. And so if his mm-hmm. glory is my delight, it also is because my glory is the delight he takes in me. And mm-hmm. therefore your glory is the delight he takes in you. And when, because we are created in his image and as image mm-hmm. bearers, we, we bear that glory, that reflected glory from mm-hmm. as, as a mirror. You know, as mm-hmm. we look at each other and you talk about that actually a lot in one of your books, I honestly, I've read them all. So I kind of get them all mixed up in my head, uh, but you yeah, talk about, too. you know, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not just me. <laughs> no. 
about how we are reflecting the glory as in a mirror, but then face to face, uh, that idea of just that reflected glory. So I love yeah. that, you know, his mm. glory, our delight, our glory is, is the delight he takes in us. Um, yeah. I can't in my French brain, and I have, I'll have a question for you about that, how culture wires the brain potentially differently and how yeah. if I'm French, my brain might be different than if I was American. I don't know. I, we, I'd love to talk about that. Uh, but in my French brain uh, slash mind, beauty and yeah. delight are intertwined very powerfully. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. how would you talk about the role of beauty in our identity? Well, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, whether you're, whether you're from Marseille or whether you're from, you know, Minneapolis, um, or These are two very different cities, my goodness, yeah, right, right. <laughs> or, you know, or if you're from Moscow for that matter, mm -hmm. or if you're from, you know, Mozambique or anywhere, you, you, Malawi, you, you keep going. Yes, indeed. Right. <laughs> All those things. Um, I, I do think that we have particular ways. I, I like I, I don't I, I fundamentally, you know, again, if we begin at the beginning, we begin with a story in the gospel narrative, in, in the biblical narrative, we begin with a story in which when God makes things, he I'm, and I'm thinking about the series that you're just coming out of. Shades of red. And yeah, mm -hmm. this this notion that God is making things when he he looked and God saw that it was good. He saw that it was good. He saw that it was good. The Hebrew word for good can be transliterated into he saw that it was beautiful. And it's not just that he saw that it was beautiful as an objective thing over there, but that the that the beauty emerged as a function of him looking at it. But all that comes out of chaos and the world was void and unformed and chaotic. And in the middle of that chaotic place, God comes and forms. And what he forms is beauty. And there is a sense in which, you know, that whole notion of there's, there's chaos, there's pain, there's carnage, there's brokenness, there's all these things, all this, and God is going to come and he's going to form beauty out of the things that are the hardest. And uh, it doesn't, it's hard for us to imagine that he's, you know, I, I come to him with the parts of me that I hate the most. Uh, but I don't, I, I usually don't come with those things up front and center. I come with the parts of me that I think will be at least a little bit acceptable. Kind of hoping to God that he doesn't find the things that are in the back of the closet. And then he comes and like waits. And he's like, I think there's more in the closet. And that's the stuff that he is envisioning beauty that I can't, I can't yet see. And I think no matter what our culture is, we, we can't get away from the fact that we are, we come into the world as these longing creatures, this, these creatures that desire thee. We, we, we desire, you know, we've got physical appetites, but it doesn't matter where you're from, you can encounter a sunset and it stops you dead in your tracks. You may have never seen Van Gogh before, but you can see the painting and you have like, and you want, and you stop and you wonder like, how did he do that? Right. You hear Beethoven's ninth and like, how did he do that? Even if he couldn't hear what he was doing, all these things. And then we see good Friday and we say, how did he do that? And this sense that we all have this longing for beauty that we will resonate with and recognize when it shows up, but we will have our own cultural ways that are particular that enable us to be okay with seeing beauty in certain ways, but will also restrict us from seeing it in other ways. And um, we each have our, you know, and I, I would say like, look, Evil does its best work in the middle of good work being done. And it will do whatever it can to hide beauty from us. It will do whatever it can to reconvince us of what it convinced the woman and the man in the garden that like, you're not nearly as beautiful as you think. You're not like, you're not really in his image. You've got to, you know, you've got to abscond with his image. You've got to take it. It's not just, and we have different cultural ways of just repeating that same story. And so uh, you may, you may have a particular you'll have a particular journey in your culture experience of what it means to work through all that. And I'll have my own 
particular journey. Uh, and but but I do think that one of the one of the you know significant things about how God brings you know somebody like me to Himself is by introducing me to you. I, my my you know Ohio brain meeting your French brain. All right, you you in in your European brain meeting your husband's brain. Like these are like Jesus is not con like content to like have everybody be the same in order to do this. Like he, the very thing that I look around and say like is what makes me so different from you is the very thing that Jesus said. Yeah, I know that was my idea to begin with. And so this notion that beauty is going to be called forth within me, in the process of my being introduced to, and loving and being with those with whom I have great difference. Um. And, uh, and, 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 and that begins with the very parts of me with which I believe I have great difference. The parts of me that I just wish I could get rid of because I hate them so much. And I hear Jesus saying, yeah, no, we're, we're bringing all that along for the ride. All that is going to be redeemed. I would much rather him just cut that out and get rid of it. And in the same way that he has parts of me that he wants to bring into redemption, he also wants that to happen between me and others, not least of which being those with whom I have great difference. And all that becomes this beauty that is beyond my capacity to imagine until I actually find myself being part of that process. Yeah, that's long winded. Yeah. Sorry. It's oh, no, I love it. It again, it's it's like listening to you read a lot of your own books. Um, mm. I OK, it's interesting. So this brings to my French mind. Um, I love playing on the nuances of words in English and in French. And uh, there's I'm actually in the process of writing a book about that, about how um, how to experience scripture in French without speaking French and by using how some words are loaded culturally slightly differently and how mm -hmm. we might translate words a little differently. So for example, uh, everything you're saying might, reminds me of one of my, um, one of the things I've discovered is there's a French word, it's called, it's the word valeur. And that word valeur has several English translations. So we have one word in French, valeur, that you would have several English words for. And those words are value, valeur, and worth, which are value and worth are kind of the same, but worth and valor are both translated value in French. And so it's very interesting because in my mind, worth and valor are the same thing because it's mm. only one word in French. Mm. So in mm -hmm. English, I've learned to decipher those two different concepts that were merged it for me before. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, the word valeur in French um, is also specifically echoing in art, um, the nuances of a given color on a painting. So the nuances of blue in a painting are going to be called values of blue. And so mm -hmm. I, I maybe in English too, is that what it's called? Values or like just I, I've, I've never heard. I mean, I'm not an art, I'm not an art historian or Neither specialist, am I. But, I, but, but, am I. Heard, but, but I've never heard that before. I've never heard so, it expressed like that. So see, in French, worth and valor in English would actually in French be linked to the idea of the nuances of color in a painting or the nuances mm -hmm. in the sunset or the nuances of music uh, mm -hmm. with the same accord. And yeah. so it's that idea of the differences that make us all unique. Exactly what you're yeah. saying, how we are all different, but we are all uh, values or shades of blue yeah. or red or whatever, but we are all yeah. humans complementing one another. So that's yeah. what it made yeah. me think of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. And uh, well, and I, I love how that, um, I mean, even just your, not just your rational explanation of this that you've just provided, but also um, how obviously your description of it has uh, energized you in fresh ways, right? It, 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 it changes your sense and your experience of your world and your life and so forth and so on. And um, again, that whole notion of God using all, all kinds of things to awaken us to uh, the life that he has for us that we are often uh, that I, that I'm that I, I wouldn't be aware of if I don't speak to someone who uh, is a native French speaking person. Yeah. Yes. And I, I can echo this having lived in different cultures and having 
uh, feeling so tremendously privileged to have experienced um, faith or just life in general through the eyes of different cultures and, and people, obviously, because people and cultures obviously go together so much. Um, and not just in the beauty, but also in the difficulty and the hardship. As you were saying, Good Friday um, is beautiful because of Sunday as well. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a theme here on gospel spice because spices, most of them have to be crushed in order to release their fragrance, mm -hmm. their aroma. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's another French thing. Fragrance and flavor are the same word in French. Aha. Uh -huh. And so for wow. me, like I, in English, sometimes I just said spices have fragrance, but they primarily have flavor because in French, it's the same thing. Um, so anyway, that's another yes, thing. Very good, very but good. Um, very good. the crushing that comes from, I mean, that the, the crushing that leads to the creation of beauty uh, in cooking or in spiritual spices, you talk about that. I was flabbergasted at the end of your book, The Soul of Desire, when you described the process of Nihonga, uh, mm. the Japanese painting, mm -hmm. and you explain mm -hmm. how the, the pigments have to be pulverized. And mm -hmm. you literally say that beauty comes from pulverization. And I'm sorry mm -hmm. if I'm saying it wrong, but... No, no, no. Um, it's, it's a very, it's you, very beautifully, you... beautifully spoken... French accented English word. <laughs> My kids make fun yeah. of me for that. Trust no, me. No. <laughs> Great. So tell yeah. us about um, this process of, I mean, I thought it was stunning how you explain how you, you witnessed the process of the painting. Um, right. Tell us, can you walk us through that a little bit? Right. Well, uh, this, uh, my, my friend Makoto Fujimura, who is the Japanese American painter who um, has studied and uh, used this particular art form of Nyonga in his work. Um, I had the privilege a number of years ago to spend a week with him with some others and we were kind of collaborating as he painted uh, and using this particular uh, Japanese form of Nyonga, as you mentioned. And, you know, there are th these, these minerals, they, you know, they, they're, they're mined uh, and they're like rocks and these rocks have to be hand, they are hand pulverized. They're not done by machines, they're hand pulverized, which if you can just try to get your head around that, I really can't. And they are minerals, which means they're, 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 uh, they create refraction. So the way the mineral, you know, it's, it's, it's ground to a consistency of talc. And that talc is mixed together with a fairly uh, uh, liquidy, uh, glue. And so when you mix them together, it, it looks like regular paint. But really what it is, is a dense suspension of all of this dust in this glue. And then Maku will apply so it's this. literally ruby glue or gold or silver glue with That's literally right. those pigments inside. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And, uh, so, if, and, and if it's not in glue, it will be something like he'll, he'll take, uh, you know, 24 karat uh, gold sheets that are, you know, micro filaments in width and stick them in this little, basically pepper shaker thing. Uh, I think that's what it's called, a pepper shaker thing. And <laughs> that's um, the technical term I can confirm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and there's a plunger and he, and what he does, he will plunge these uh, and, and as after he has layered, for instance, uh, he'll he'll put help out of have put it down a layer of malachite for instance a layer where he's put it on the canvas he might lift the canvas and let let the malachite just go where it goes and then he will take this gold leaf and he will uh, use this plunger and you will see coming out of the plunger uh, gold dust that now floats across the surface and lands where it will and of course he's really good at what he does but the gold sometimes doesn't all land on the canvas. There is a sense of extravagance in which this procedure moves forward. And, you know, this, this kind of paint, like it takes a long time for it to dry. So for instance, it may, it may take several weeks for one layer of this to dry. And so before the next layer goes on, it, it's, it's time consuming for this to happen. And the other thing is that once this is completed, 
because they are minerals, over time in their interaction with light, uh, they are oxidized. And so the nature of the painting, even after it's done, will change over time and uh, become even more radiantly blue, more, radi more radiantly beautiful. And the more finely pulverized yes. the mineral is, the more refraction there is that takes place. So light comes to the canvas, bounces off the mm -hmm. canvas and comes back through this refraction. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's almost, they become almost too difficult to look at. They're so overwhelmingly beautiful. And, um, uh, it's and then and, and he talks he, he, he you know Mako's written this lovely book called art and faith and um he talks about this process and you know when after we had this encounter back several years ago uh it was when i started to think oh my goodness like i think this is what we're doing all the time this is what we're doing in our practice that what and so Hence, in, in the soul of desire, we start, we talk an awful lot about this idea of shifting people's attention from asking the question, what's wrong with me? What's my pathology? What's my diagnosis? To asking the question, what is the next artifact of beauty that God and I want to create together? And the shift in that question, it's not that asking a question about what is the problem is unhelpful or unimportant. It is, but we spend an inordinate amount of time just sitting with that question and trying to answer that. And, and, and that's how we live our life. A lot of our life is lived. Uh, my life is defined by the problem that I am as opposed to the beauty that I want to create. Yeah. That's, um, we need that. Yeah. Our Western culture really needs to remember uh, the importance of beauty and grace and love preceding mm -hmm. shame and sin. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we are hardwired, especially as Christians. I mean, oftentimes we've been hardwired to believe that. It's interesting because, again, I'm sorry, I keep bringing this back to my French. I don't know. I don't normally do this on the podcast, but today it just feels uh, how you're saying how those um, dust, those gold dusts and gold flakes ended up on the canvas. I've seen... Um, Patisserie chefs do that in France with patisserie. I mean, those very fancy cakes uh, where they sprinkle 24 carat, the same, probably it's edible, right? Uh, in very small doses, I would assume. Right, but right, they sprinkle yeah. it, you know, they, <laughs> and same thing. There's that I've seen the same extravagance. So sometimes it just goes to the sides. And it's like, right. what do you do with that? And um, okay, here's the link for me with this. Uh, another French word that doesn't work in English the same way. Uh, because it's linked to food. So our ministry motto here at Gospel Spice is taste and see. Mm. So I link the idea of delighting in the glory of God, delighting in God, delight mm. with the idea mm. of tasting and seeing. For mm. me, it's the same thing. And I have a good reason for that because in French, um, I have one word, which is the word delice, which actually has two English translations, delight mm. and deliciousness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So delight. So in French, God in one word is both delightful and delicious. Mm -hmm. So he's beautiful, mm -hmm. but he's also mm -hmm. tasty. So taste and see, there's something mm -hmm. very, um, you appropriate this idea of the delight of God mm -hmm. as you taste and see. So that idea of mm -hmm. delight. So to me, when you were talking about gold and painting and gold mm -hmm. and food, uh, taste mm -hmm. and see delighting because God mm -hmm. is both delightful and delicious. Um, mm -hmm. And that takes us back to spices and beauty. I mean, I've never seen all those connections between beauty and spices and the crushing and the flavor and the extravagance of all of that. Um, well, and not to mention the fact that, it was, you know, at least in, in the work that I do, um, one of the reasons why I think it's so important is because it uh, uh, pays honor to the way our brains actually work. Mm -hmm. We and not just believers, but as human beings in general, like when we, when we think about this whole notion that we are going to take from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, you know, uh, in the soul of shame, I invite the reader, reader to consider that the whole notion of shame begins before the fruit gets taken. There is a wound. There's a wound that takes place. I put that up there's for a, people to see. There's a there wound that takes place in the very conversation that the serpent is having with the woman. Mm -hmm. 
And this wound is something that we sense. We don't, a, a wound is not an abstraction. You know, when I, when you, when you hurt my feelings, like you literally hurt my feelings and I feel it literally in my chest. It's not just a, an abstract thing that happened. Yeah. And so the serpent makes a connection for the woman's sensations and makes the connection between, makes a connection for her between God and pain and wraps these things around with each other. And how am I going to cope with that? And we then often come in our Western traditions to try to convince people logically and linearly about the gospel. This is the truth. This is the abstraction, so forth and so on, without recognizing that that's not actually how the brain works, nor is it going to receive the gospel in this way. Until I sense the gospel, I won't ever make sense of the gospel. And so when you talk about taste, this is what von Balthasar would say, well, of course, right? The, the, the Swiss theologian would say, of course, beauty precedes everything because, uh, uh, you know, beauty is goodness wrapped in light. It is, it is, you know, it is goodness's character. It's its nature that we first encounter. This is how we as human beings encounter the world. We don't first encounter the world as thinking beings. We first encounter the world as sensing beings. First we sense, then we make sense of what we sense. And so much of the story that we tell in order to make sense of what we sense is a story that is wrapped in the serpent's lie that this is all my fault. There's nothing I can do about this and all, all the stuff that shame would want to tell. And so when someone comes along and says, no, wait, I want you to sense this. I want you to taste this. And I'm like, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I like the notion, but the last time I tasted something, like, I know how this movie ends. So I don't really want to have anything to do with like that particular spice you're offering me. So it's, it's, it's hard for us to do this. It's difficult for me to be receptive to being loved because I have too much experience with love being associated with being wounded. And the story that I then tell about that, that only reinforces that. And so I love that your mission begins with sense, with how we sense, because that in fact, invariably is how we enter into connection with anything in the world. I first must sense, only then do I make sense of what I'm sensing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know, I keep going back to the French thing. I really wasn't planning on doing that, <laughs> but um, the American, maybe uh, under your expert uh, advice, I think one of the ways to define success in America might be by the, uh, or luxury more than success. The idea of luxury in America might be the abundance of your possessions, right? Mm. Sure. Um, in France, uh, again, being a very hedonistic culture, which goes down the wrong path in all sorts of ways apart from Christ, but we, we like to think of luxury as an experience that involves all five senses at once. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's luxurious. So mm -hmm. for me, one of, the, one of the examples I love to give as one of the most luxurious experiences you can have is to bite off a French croissant because mm. you have all five senses that are involved in it. And so again, it's back to food, but it's um, that idea of approaching luxury through the five senses, because that's how God created us. And I love how you, you've said, you know, our feelings uh, are wounded on the inside. And um, so no wonder that shame takes root on the inside and we mm. can't always express it because a lot of wounds don't have scars, right? I mean, we might have physical scars on our bodies, uh, but the scars are on the outside. The wound is mm. actually on the inside and mm -hmm. shame, shame won't let itself out. Mm. You, um, ca can you talk a little bit about this concept I felt was so well, um, articulated in, I think it's in the soul of shame where you talk about shame's attendant. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about that concept and how, how that just works? Well, I, I think the notion emerged for me, um, mm -hmm. you know, when, when, we, when we imagine, uh, you know, I, I, I have all these things that I say to myself all day, every day. 
you should have done this. You should have done that. You're already late. Yeah. All, all the things, right? It's just, a, it's just a list. It's a running tape, right? Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah. And at some point I thought, well, wait a minute. Um, I, I, I realize it, it, is, it is me who's saying these things. There, there is a part of me that is turning around and saying those things, the rest of me. And then I thought, well, what, what, what would happen if we were to get some distance between us and this? Uh, we would notice that this attendant of ours, and, and I, I think in the book, I, I said, you know, typically when we use the word attendant, we typically imagine that that is going to be a, a person who's attending to us, who's like looking out for us, who wants our best interest. They're going to take care of us. And this attendant is attending to us, but with the intention of devouring us. And I think the, the, the purpose of inviting people to imagine it is to um, in, uh, awaken us to just how pervasive and prominent the activity of shame is and that it is evil's intention. It is not, it's not just, it doesn't just happen to be happening. It is happening with intention. And the more we use it, the better it gets at its job. And our mission is to, uh, you know, relieve it of its duties over time. And it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but I think in giving it a kind of embodied otherness, it gives us an opportunity to be able to separate ourselves from this. And uh, we, we probably don't have time for this. Uh, the work of Richard Schwartz and internal family systems is one other way that we often talk about this idea that we have these different parts within us that have these different conversations with us and represent different parts and times of our lives. And this shame attendant often is like, is one of those parts. It's like its job is to collect and curate every and any element of shame that it can find and every opportunity that it gets, it's gonna remind us of the various ways that we are not enough, that we are inferior, that we are inadequate and all the rest. And in this way, it kind of embodies and distills the kind of personal essence of the accuser which is the other name in English that we give for evil in the scriptures. And that when we, when we find that as it turns out at the end of the day, uh, Satan's most uh, prolific way of attempting to devour us is through accusation. And even when I'm tempted to want to do something, like I, I'm tempted to you know, consume something, to look at something, to be angry at somebody, to be greedy, like all the ways in which I'm tempted, that temptation comes in the wake of and in the presence of the accuser saying that there's something about me that isn't enough. And so I'm going to need to get angry. I deserve to do this. I do all the things that temptation becomes for me comes on the heels of the accusation that there's something that's not enough of me where I find myself in this moment. What I love, um, you know, by sitting at your feet and reading your books and trying to understand how all of this works is that you take us beyond just a logical linear explanation like you just mm. did, which we need uh, because we do need that left brain to function, but you take us to a... Um, a deeper, more experiential way to understand things. Because again, mm -hmm. we need to make sense of what we're sensing. And so we can't just linearly explain the gospel, nor can we linearly logically explain shame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's why um, I think, um, not to put words in your mouth, but I've seen, I've heard you explain that the one of the best ways to start countering that shame attendant uh, is to dwell on Psalm 27, four. Mm -hmm. And that's the bulk mm -hmm. of the soul of desire, which I love because mm -hmm. it's one of my favorite verses in scripture. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. to gaze on the beauty of the Lord mm -hmm. and to inquire mm -hmm. in his temple, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't have it mm -hmm. before me and I should, but I don't. So um, oh, good. it's no shame talking, right? <laughs> that's right, exactly. So right. It's, it's the bulk of the soul of desire is to move us away from our focus on shame uh, after we've understood it and its roots, because you can't mm -hmm. unroot something you don't understand and you don't experience yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and wrap your head around and not just mm -hmm. your head, but your heart. But then you move us to uh, Psalm 27, four, and you, um, you allow us to really taste it. 
and to mm. experience it and to mm. dissect it, but not in a log yes, in a logical way, but way beyond again, that merging of the left and the right brain and how mm. you just mm. uh, allow mm. experience to inform knowledge and vice versa, which by the way, that's another thing in French, you have one word English to know, we have two words in French. Uh, that's where there's more French words than English words. Mm -hmm. um, you're to know, which is a thousand times in scripture, the word to know. Uh, mm -hmm. In French, 300 of those times is savoir, uh, as in savoir faire, which means head knowledge, uh, which is more left brain, um, mm -hmm. which is more, you know, historical knowledge, uh, the dates, um, even wisdom from Proverbs is, is head knowledge, is savoir. And mm -hmm. then 700 times, mostly from Paul in the New Testament, it's connaître. Uh, which is experiential knowledge, mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. a knowledge that you always grow into. You're never done knowing uh, mm -hmm, like historical mm -hmm. facts. I mean, there comes a point where you can say you cannot figure out the history and you know you're an expert at something, mm -hmm. whereas experiential knowledge, you're never done knowing. So it's the difference between knowledge and a knowing, a doing versus a being. So that's there's a French difference right there for you. And that's what you do in the soul of desire. You move us away from knowledge and towards a knowing, like mm -hmm. a deeper being within mm -hmm. that knowing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. can you tell mm -hmm. us about how to use that Psalm and maybe something mm -hmm. that, something that um, speaks to you right now about that Psalm? Gazing on the beauty so, of the So Lord. I'm going to, so I'm going to, I'll, I'll give you an example of something that happened this week. Mm -hmm. uh, so in uh, our, in our work, we, uh, we, we, work in these confessional communities and uh, this past week uh, we had an experience in which one of the members in the community um, began to speak about their particular experience in their home and this person has you know uh, over a number of months this person has talked about their experiences in their home um, in, 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 a, in a clear general terms, whereby which the other members of the group have a fairly well, uh, a fairly good understanding of what it was like for this person to be in their home. And they started to talk about a particular incident. And before you know it, they went from then to a different incident, to a different incident, to a different incident, all within a period of about two, three to four minutes. And at one point, you, you, and you could tell that they were becoming increasingly distressed and physically were becoming increasingly distressed. And th at one point then said, I don't know why I'm talking about all of these things. I've never said, I've never talked about these things before. And if, if, when you're looking around the room, you start to see other people that are like sitting forward in their seats, in their, you know, in their chairs and and this person, they're becoming more and more distressed and turned to me and I'm sitting two people away, turned to me and said, I need your help. And what happened over the next 10 minutes, I will have to say, uh, will, will live with me forever. Um, because they were plainly like, see our, 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 our common, um, response to something like this is that we want to explain what they need to do in order for them to be less distressed so that they'll be less distressed so that I'll be less distressed. Yes. Like so we do true. with our parents, yes. like we do with, with our mm -hmm. parenting. I'd like for you yeah. to behave so that I'm not upset as your parent. And so that I can go back to living with the illusion that I'm a pretty good parent. I have teenagers. I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, but in, the, in those moments, that's not actually what the brain needs. The brain needs to know that, first of all, that we, I, am willing to dwell with you. Like, I'm not leaving the room, yes. and I'm not leaving my chair, and I'm not going to do anything other than just ask you, which I did. I just want you to put your hand over your chest, and I want you to look at me. I just want you to look at me, and I want you to feel your hand on your chest. With your chest, feel your hand. And now with your hand, feel your chest. I'm going to slow this process down and I want you to take two slow, deep breaths. Keep looking at me. And of course, th th this person was not, was not in a good place. And 
then I gradually just invited them to say, what do you, I want you to describe what you see with me. Describe what you see. Keep your hand on your, describe what you see. Do I, oh, you're not mad. You know, I, I know that's not what I, that's what I'm not. What am I? Do I look like I'm comfortable? Yes. I look like I'm pleased to be with you looking at you. Yes. I want you to pay attention, not just to the fact. I want you to just pay attention to what it feels like to have this happen. Over time, I, and this is all taking place in a period of about seven minutes. Over time, I said, now when you're ready, I want you to start to gradually look around at the others in the room. One by one, take your time. And of course, I hadn't been looking at the others. I'm counting on the others to be coming for her. I'm counting on the others to be looking at her with compassion and expectation, hope. And as I started to then eventually look around, that's exactly what they were doing because they're being drawn into this space. This takes place over a period of about seven minutes and gradually they become much more calm, much more at ease to which I would say, okay, what were we doing? We've, first of all, we've been, we've established in this space over a period of many, many months that this is a place where people are dwelling. This is a place where people are naming their life stories. They're telling the things that are, that are difficult. And so by the time these items started to tumble out of their mouth, things that they hadn't planned on saying, things that were, that were, that were embarrassing and terrifying for them to say, they were doing so because they had already been dwelling in a place where people were hearing each other's stories, some of which were very, very painful and hard to hear. But when that started to happen and all the chaos starts to show up in the room, that's, this is when the gazing needs to happen. It's not hard for us to gaze upon Mako Fujimura's paintings. It's not hard to gaze upon a Van Gogh. It's not hard for us to gaze upon a croissant. Like even though, like I, in the one time I've been to Paris, like I just want to look at them before I eat them. I just want to look at them. Gazing at beauty is not hard to do. But the notion of allowing ourselves to be gazed upon when we only imagine ourselves to be its opposite is virtually impossible. But it was something that this person was willing to allow me and then others to do. And this is what we would say is taking place on Good Friday. Yes, exactly. Yes. Jesus publicly allowing us to see him. And it is in this gazing that literally, when we are gazing with loving kindness, that literally our right brains talk to your right, you know, your right brain talks to mine. And so that long before we have to come up with words to fix the problem or resolve the distress, our bodies are already doing this because of the intention of those who are coming for the one who's in distress. Now, once this was able, once this took place, we were then able to inquire. We dwell, we gaze, we inquire, and we are gazing again, not at that which is easy to look upon, but that which is difficult to look upon. And in the moment that that happens, we now have had an experience in which we are feeling comfortable and confident in the middle of having named the parts of ourselves that we hate the most. We've never had an experience like this. It doesn't make any logical sense because logic is not where God begins. Logic is how we make sense of what God has already done. And with this, we, and, and, and we see like, this takes time. This doesn't just happen overnight. This person would probably not have been in a position to name some of the things that they named had they not spent some months creating a foundation of trust in this community where in which these things start to tumble out and you wonder how did this tumble out? Well, I'll tell you, it, it, it tumbled out because you've already been creating trust in a space where this was ready to tumble out. But once it's out, then it feels horrific. And we get a sense of why it is that you've been like not talking about this for, you know, 40 years. But in the moment that you do, and 
we then ask, well, where are you? And then we ask, what do you want? And we ask Jesus' question, do you love me? Because what we're really saying is, we're going to come for the shame wherever it is. Because he's just not willing for any of that to remain. And he wants to know if we're willing to drink the cup because this is hard work. We acknowledge that this is not a walk in the park. Crucifixion is hard. And it is beautiful when seen in the light of Easter. The spirit hovered over the water before mm-hmm. God spoke. Mm-hmm. Uh, the hovering in in uh, in Hebrew, it's the same word used for dove. So it's that mm-hmm. idea of, and the dove is known for dwelling. So actually, in mm-hmm. Hebrew, the hovering is linked mm-hmm. to the dove, which is linked mm-hmm. to dwelling, mm-hmm. which obviously links to the tabernacle and the temple, mm-hmm. um, and it connects all the dots and then only then does God speak, which Mm. is linear thinking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Uh, mm -hmm, So the mm -hmm. hovering, the dwelling precedes Mm -hmm, even mm -hmm. Genesis one, one, the the hovering precedes the speaking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know how God's brain quote unquote works, (laughs) but if there's a left and right brain sounds like it, but what do I know? We're not going (laughs) to, I I don't know how to go there, but I I don't either. uh, So, um, we are just cutting this off the interview quickly. Uh, it's uh, 4.06. I'm very mindful of your time. Uh, do you have a hard stop right now? Do we have a little bit more time? I'll get some time. Okay. All right. Yeah. So can I just, uh, I want us to conclude and we'll go back into the yeah. interview. Um, and then uh, if that's all right, I'd like you to record like a one minute video that we'll use um, to promote the episode. If that's all right. Okay. I'll, I'll guide you through it if you okay. want. Um, oh, I'll need guidance. No, you don't. Oh, <laughs> You've done that. I've seen you do this so many times. <laughs> okay. So you, ha- um, you have you have no idea how much guidance I need. <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Okay. All right. So let's get back into what you were saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you're describing the confessional communities, um, it hmm. spoke to me so much. And uh, I think we all long for the experience you're describing. Um Of course, we'd like to skip to the end without having the pain, but I don't think that's realistic. And so um, you call that practicing heaven. It's got to be one of the- Yeah, practicing practicing for heaven. Yes, practicing for heaven. Um, It's got to be one of the most beautiful expressions I've heard to describe this very difficult process of Hmm. dwelling with one another, being Hmm. mirrors to one another, being imago dei to one another. Mm, so mm, tell us about mm. what it's like to practice for heaven. Well, you know, the, uh, the, um, uh, the inspiration for this, I think in, in many respects for me, uh, comes from a couple of sources. Uh, one of those sources being C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. I, I've often said to oh. people, if I one of my favorites it's yeah. one of those i recommend yeah. reading every year yeah. i don't read yeah. it every year but every time yeah. i read it like i see things i had never seen before it's so short you would think yeah. but no right no right yeah <laughs> I've, I've often told people that if i was told that i could only have one book that would be the book i would take i would take mm-hmm. it because uh so th- this this sense that people are grad you know they're introduced they come out of hell and they're introduced to heaven here's heaven um it's so hard good luck, yeah, good luck. Yeah, right. they, they physically yeah. can't take it yeah right exactly and they have to grow into being more able to be present with it so that was one of the major you know kind of inspiration like just imagine like what it means for us to like no we have to get ready for this and even when it arrives there's going to be it might take some getting used to like i think oh it'll all just be great. like you know god takes us far more seriously than this i think it seems and the other then is this uh, passage in Matthew uh, 20, where Jesus makes the comment is that uh, everybody will have to give a reason, right? They'll have oh. to explain every idle word. And I'm thinking, I'm so screwed. I am so like, I like, like, I just like, this is not, I don't, yes. I don't know. 
No, apart no, from no, no. grace, there's just so much anxiety right. just thinking right. about that. Right, mm-hmm. exactly. But he doesn't, you know, he 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 does not shrink back from that. He's like, no, everybody will have to give an account for every idle word. And then I got to thinking, what if it's Jesus to whom we are giving an account? And what if he does for us what we are asked to do by dwelling and gazing? And inquiring and what if with every you know it, when i was a kid uh we used to have these you know these these uh like eight page little tracks these cartoon tracks for the gospel they would they, they had these here and, and it would and it would be basically it would be kind of like fire and brimstone kind of like you know if you don't you know that look on your face right there like that's the thing but this is this is what you're reading right and in one one version is like you know at the judgment and you're there's a there's a picture of a person and god on the throne and there's your life up on the screen in front of billions of people like you're you know you're kind of it's a little up terrifying to, yeah right taking up to the front of the classroom and you're going to be sort of like now explain explain how you got the answer to this problem mr thompson and um and then i imagine what if jesus says yes you're going to give an account for every idle word and he's going to have the conversation with us and he's going to say, let's talk about this. Let's talk about what you, what, what, what you did here. Tell me about that. And I don't want to talk to him about this. And he said, no, tell me about this. And so you begin and he then says, well, tell me more about where that came from. And what was that about? Yeah, I understand that would have been hard. Yeah. And that wasn't a choice that you in hindsight would have made the same way. I get that. And what, and, and like, if you, if you hear the spirit of Jesus having the kind of conversation that we are trying to have in these confessional communities, it suddenly struck me like, oh my goodness, he is going to be quite serious about us doing this work right down to the, right, right down to the bone. And I'm afraid of it. And he, and I can imagine him saying like, no, 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 you don't understand. We need to do the work because if you don't, you can't live in my heaven. Kind of like you need to do the work or the heaven will continue to be too bright, too brilliant, too, too hard. And I want you to live here. And so we got to do work. We have work to do. And in the course of your giving an account of every idle word, you need to know, like, I'm not going to be in the business of rubbing your nose in it. I'm not going to be in the business of shaming. I'm not going to flinch at it. I'm not going, we're not going to apologize for things. You're going to say you're sorry for stuff that you're sorry. Like, and I'm just like, I accept that. Now tell me what, what happened next. And you, one can imagine, oh my goodness, like the more I practice this, the more I eventually get to point like, well, I just want to keep talking to him like about everything because I'm learning that it's not just the story that I'm telling, but it's what I anticipate my outcome is going to be and that he is undoing all of that, which is undoing all of the lie from the garden. Yeah. And then I said like, and so like, it's going to like, no wonder we're going to need eternity. Because like the amount of time it's going to take for each of us to tell the entirety of our story, to give account for every idle word, for everything that I've sensed and imaged and felt and thought, you know, the time of jealousy and the time of irritability and the time of like I held my grudge and all, all the things. But in addition to like the longing that I longed for that I never had, that was completely reasonable and good and beautiful, but I never, you know, the, the thing I trained to do all my life and I never got the job that I thought I was going to have. Or, you know, I, I really wanted to be married and I, I didn't I didn't have a spouse or I was in a marriage that I lived with for a long time. But it, and the whole notion of dwelling and gazing and inquiring uh, becomes a project that uh, I think that if we're practicing now, by the time we by the time the new heaven and earth gets here, we're going to be uh, we want to saddle up and ride. Yes. Yeah. We will need glorified bodies to sustain the beauty mm. of heaven. Mm. Mm-hmm. And uh, if our glorified bodies um, have anything to do with the glory of God, which they will, um, yeah. it, it will, again, it goes, goes back to delighting in the glory of God through the delight that he takes in us because our glorified bodies, if our glory is the extent of the delight he takes in us, which is infinite, then our glorified bodies are the bodies 
minds and soul and spirit that have fully integrated the depth of the delight he takes in us. Mm -hmm. That's what a glorified body would be. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we can only fully integrate the delight he takes in us when we go past that shame and it is met with grace every single mm -hmm. time. That's how yeah. we learn that grace is real. Yeah. More that, that real as in like it has physical density, it's tangible, it's every, there's no such thing as void uh, or, or, you know, space, empty space. There's, there's molecules of air around us, but th there's a heaviness of grace that permeates mm. the air around us, the very presence in every relationship. There is the Holy Spirit fills mm. the air mm. between you and me with mm -hmm. grace. Mm -hmm. And in those confessional communities, mm -hmm. that's exactly what you're doing. And uh, in the same way, I think in Christ, we want to develop those many confessional communities or, or the models at the end of the mm -hmm. book, you, mm -hmm. you describe some rules um, mm. to try to start things like that, you know, and mm -hmm. I know you don't like rules, but like kind of some guidelines and things. Oh, and, it, it, these it, are it, things to do within families, within, you know, marriage. I mean, a lot of the confessional community principles you describe, um, I want more of that in my marriage. Uh, mm -hmm. I happen to be married to the most wonderful man on earth, I think. Uh, and I hope he feels the same way about me. Uh, but it's, you know, it, it's hard work, as you said, you know, if, if um, I mean, crucifixion is hard work, marriage is hard yeah. work, parenting is yeah. hard work. And so um, remembering that grace fills the space between us in mm -hmm. any relationship um, mm -hmm. cannot bring anything but healing eventually. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so practicing for heaven so that our glorified mm -hmm. bodies can take the density of heaven, mm -hmm. the density of the glory of heaven, mm -hmm. um, that yeah. is food for thought. Hmm. Talk about tasting and seeing tasting. that the Lord yeah. is good. Yeah. Right on. Right on. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, I could keep talking forever, but I think we need to wrap it up. So, um, Kurt Thompson, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm, yeah. um, I'm very humbled and privileged that we mm. would share your wisdom with our audience. Mm. And uh, we'll have all the links in the show notes for them to get your books and mm. all the things because mm. um you bring a lot of wisdom and um your voice is a little unusual in our generation and much needed so i'm grateful for that mm. so thank you oh. oh you're you're most welcome i'm man i i again i um uh, i uh i mean to your to your point and to your mission i so in in preparing for this i was you know, I looked to your website and I listened to. Oh wow, that's impressive. Most people don't do that. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, and uh, and it was lovely to do that. So I was able to see your team and um, and listen oh, they're to, the best. Yeah, and listened uh, to you know a, a clip of your one of your public presentations. Okay. And I um, I just I want I want to I want to commend you and your team for your work, and also just recognizing that as I was listening to your public presentation that there plainly is uh, uh, that the presence of the Spirit of God is upon you. And uh, it's not just in the information of which you speak, uh, but it is the movement of the Spirit in the very presence of your embodied self that is in the room and that is on the loose. And so it's been my privilege to um, be even uh, separated down the coastline by a couple hundred miles. It's been my privilege to be in the room with you today. So thank you for inviting me. It's been an honor and um, it's been a, and a delight to be here. Mm, thank you. There is nothing like feeling, you know, seen. So thank you for mm -hmm. that. That mm -hmm. means uh, more than I can express. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. You're welcome. And now, a brief message from Gospel Spice. Did you know that Gospel Spice has a library of in-depth Bible studies available online for free? Discover our previous podcast studies on your own or with friends and enjoy exclusive content that includes listening guides for each teaching episode, study questions, verses to memorize, tips, and more. Just visit gospelspice.com and click on the Studies tab. Now back to the podcast. Now, back to the video. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. Merci. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel and click that bell icon so you are the first to know when we release a new video or episode. 
Also, would you please consider helping us reach new people with the good news of the spice of the gospel by leaving a five-star review for the Gospel Spice podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, iTunes, Google, etc. Finally, share and follow us on social media to spread the word of Gospel Spice. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to tune in our podcast with new episodes every Friday. I'll see you in our next video very soon right here. Merci.